namo bhagavate vasudevaya Brahme mahurta uthaya Varyupas prisyam madhavaha Dadyo prasanna karana Atmanam tamasaparam Brahme mahurte During the most suitable period of the day for spiritual activity, before sunrise, Uthaya, rising, Vari, water, Upasprisya, touching, Madhava, Lord Krishna, Dadyao, meditated, Prasanna, Prasanna, clear, clear. Karana, Karana, his mind, his mind. Atmanam, Atmanam, upon himself. Upon himself. Tamasa, Tamasa. Ignorance. ignorance, Param, Param. Beyond. beyond. Lord Madhava would rise during the Brahma Mahurta period and touch water. With a clear mind, he would then meditate upon himself, the single, self luminous, unequaled, and infallible supreme truth known as Brahman, who by his very nature ever dispels all contamination and who through his personal energies, which cause the creation and destruction of this universe, manifests his own pure and blissful existence. Purport. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur points out that the Lord, that the word bhava in this verse indicates the created beings. Thus the compound word lakshata bhava nivritam means that Lord Krishna gives pleasure to the created beings through his various energies. Of course the soul is never created, but our material conditioned existence is created by the interaction of the Lord's energies. One who is favored by the Lord's internal potency can understand the nature of the absolute truth. This understanding is called Krishna consciousness. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains that his energies are divided into inferior and superior, or material and spiritual potencies. The Brahma Samhita further explains that the material potency acts like a shadow, following the movements of the spiritual reality, which is the Lord himself and his spiritual potency. When one is favored by Lord Krishna, he reveals himself to the surrendered soul, and thus the same creation that formerly covered the soul becomes an impetus for spiritual enlightenment. Lord Madhava would rise during the Brahma Mahorta period and touch water. With a clear mind, he would then meditate upon himself, the single self luminous, unequaled, and infallible supreme truth known as Brahman, who by his very nature ever dispels all contamination, and who through his personal energies, which cause the creation and destruction of this universe, manifests his own pure and blissful existence.
We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 70, entitled Lord Krishna's Daily Activities. Texts 4 and 5. Shukadev Goswami is sharing a particle of, Srila, of Lord Sri Krishna's daily life. In Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said that even Ananta Shesha, with his limitless mouths, cannot explain the activities that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Chaitanya, could perform even in one minute. Cannot explain all the activities of the Lord that he performs even in a minute. Even if he had the entire span of the entire life of the universe to do so. So we understand Krishna is a chintya. He is inconceivable. But part of the inconceivable power of the absolute truth is to make himself conceivable while still being inconceivable. In the previous chapter, Shukadeva Goswami explained Narada Muni coming to Dwaraka. Because Narada Muni heard of how Krishna liberated Narakasura or Bhaumasura. And then after over 16,000 queens took shelter of him, gave their hearts to him, he married all of them and brought them all to his home in Tvarka an island in the sea. And there he had Vishwakarma create wonderful palaces for each one of them. Now Narada Muni is a very, very um, perfect, genuine brahmachari. (laughs) And still he was so interested in this incredible um, pastime. Narada Muni, this great brahmachari, is so very interested to hear about Krishna's household life. So he came to Dwarka, and what he saw was extraordinary, astonishing, incredible. When Narada Muni came into Dwarka, just seeing the beauty of that place. It is explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam that Vishwakarma himself, who is the architectural engineer, designer of all the demigods, he personally made the architectural design for each one of Krishna's palaces. 16,108. And it's not that he used the same design for all of them. (laughs) Each was unique by Krishna's arrangement. And he was seeing the beautiful ponds, the wonderful trees, listening to the birds singing. He came into the palace where Krishna was with Rukmini Devi. And there he saw Rukmini, the principal of all the queens of Lord Krishna, the goddess of fortune herself, 
the internal potency, the pleasure potency of Krishna, the source of Durga and Kali and Bhumi. And Rukmini was surrounded by so many maidservants who were very beautiful and highly qualified. And yet, Rukmini herself was fanning Krishna with the chamara. It's very simple menial service, but she was sewing. She's the goddess of fortune. So many people here in India worship her uh, Lakshmi Puja, Durga Puja, because they want success. They want a healthy family, they want money, they want victory. And here is Lakshmi herself, who, who bestows all of these things, who has everything. And she's showing that there is no greater wealth than devotional service. Some Siddhi Toshanam. Devotional service means to, to speak, to think, to act in such a way that Krishna is pleased. And sometimes we think Krishna is pleased by um, very extraordinary accomplishments according to the worldly perspective. Lakshmi could have just started creating universes. (laughs) But she was doing what every single one of us could do. Even a little child. I've seen even two, three-year-old children with a little chamra going... (laughs) They don't even know the alphabet yet. But they can fan Krishna with the chamara. She, she used the chamara. They're a very lightweight because it's a little tail. But she was, she was showing us and she was personally experiencing what is the great, greatest of all fortune, the goddess of fortune. loving devotional service. She had so many maidservants who were willing to do that. She could have been sitting next to Krishna and had people fanning, but she was doing it herself. And just seeing this Narada Muni was extremely astonished. Krishna was so comfortable, And then Krishna got up from his bed and put his own helmet or head on Narada Muni's lotus feet. Then he offered Narada Muni his own very, very personal sitting place. And he washed Narada Muni's feet and began to glorify Narada Muni, that you are so kind, you are a liberated soul who is always absorbed in meditation on the Lord, and you go to even very poor fallen householders like me, (laughs) just to show by your example and enlighten us in the real purpose of life, and Krishna offered gifts to Narada Muni, offered wonderful prasad to Narada Muni, rendered very menial, humble services, just as Rukmini was offering very simple services to Krishna, Krishna was offering even more menial services to Narada. And after seeing this Narada Muni, he he knew that Krishna is the absolute truth, the cause of all causes, the creator of everything, the ultimate object of all worship. 
but because it was Krishna's will to worship him. Just to please Krishna, he was willing to accept that worship. That in itself is an incredible act of surrender and humility. He could have started, you know, having a fight with Krishna. No, I'm going to wash your feet. And Krishna said, no, I'm going to wash your feet. <laughs> but he just sat on Krishna's throne and allowed Krishna to wash his feet and allowed Krishna to have his queens transfer their service to him, to service to Narada. Because that's what pleases Krishna. Narada Muni was willing to perform that austerity. If you water the root of the tree, every part of the tree is happy. When you please Krishna, everyone becomes on a spiritual level happy. And that's where our greatest happiness is. And then Krishna told Narada Muni, please tell me how I may serve you. Narada Muni, now that Krishna asked, how can I serve you? <laughs> he said, you are the supreme Brahman, the absolute truth, the object of everyone's soul's love. Please give me the blessing that I will always remember you, that in every situation I will never forget you. Narada Muni left that palace because he wanted to go to some of the other palaces. And as he entered into the second palace, there was Krishna, <laughs> the same one Krishna, and he was playing chess with, his, with one of his queens and with Udhav. And they were laughing together and joking together and playing together. And then as soon as Krishna saw Narada Muni, it was as if he hadn't seen him for such a long time. <laughs> he jumped up from his seat. Oh, Narada Muni, you are so kind. You have come to my house. I'm so grateful you have come. What a good surprise this is. And he put Narada Muni on his throne and washed his feet and asked, how can I serve you? <laughs> and Narada Muni was so much overwhelmed, he was silent. He left and went to the next palace. <laughs> and there, Krishna was giving some cows to Brahmins. And he saw Narada Muni and got up and said, Oh, Narada Muni, how can I serve you? <laughs> and he honored Narada Muni, and Narada Muni went to another palace and another palace, and in each place it was as if Krishna was just seeing him for the first time after such a long time. Sometimes he saw Krishna doing some fire yagya, Sometimes he saw him doing shraddha for forefathers. Sometimes he saw him discussing different political situations in Dwarka. And other times he was sitting with Balaram and discussing some other subject. And another time he was with Satyaki speaking another subject. In different places he was with queens. Sometimes he was giving a daughter away in marriage. Sometimes he go, comes to the next house and he's receiving a daughter-in-law who just got married to one of his sons. <laughs> Sometimes he's discussing economic development for Dwarka and he's... And Narada Muni went to every single one of the 16,108 palaces. And in each place, Krishna was uniquely performing different activities with different devotees. And in each place, he was so blissfully surprised to see Narada Muni come in. 
Now, for some of us, we would kind of get tired of just going palace after palace. <laughs> but it's like hearing about Krishna. The more you, he- if we actually have some love for Krishna in our heart, even if we hear the same mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Even if we hear it hundreds of millions of times, even if it's the same melody, it will only get sweeter and sweeter. If we hear Krishna's pastimes, whether it's new pastimes or pastimes we've heard since the first day we met devotees. If there's love in our heart, it becomes more and more enchanting. We have a deeper experience. And that's a symptom of our sincerity, is our eagerness, not for just something new, but for Krishna. Because Krishna's Navayovanam Cha, he's ever new. When Lord Chaitanya would go to visit Lord Jagannath in Puri, every day was a, such a special, unique, divine experience. And all the devotees with him. because Krishna reciprocates according to our devotion. Narada Muni is himself one of the greatest of all mystics in the history of the universe. He's personally the son of Brahma. And he has the power simply by chanting Krishna's holy names to travel anywhere he so desires. Bhakti Vinod Thakur composed that beautiful poem. Narada Muni Bajai Vinarati Karamananame. He's always chanting these names of Sri Radha Raman, playing on his Vina which was given to him by Krishna. And if he wants, he goes to Vaikuntha. And he doesn't have to take a long flight. (laughs) Narada Muni could go to London. (laughs) He could go to New York. He could go to Moscow. He could go to Swargaloka, to Janaloka, to Tapaloka, to Brahmaloka, to to Shiva Loka, he can go to Vaikuntha Loka. He never gets jet lag. (laughs) How is that possible? Can you imagine the difference in time zones between here and the heavenly planets and the upper planets of the rishis and the sages? And he can be there just within minutes, within seconds. That's his city. That's his powers. And he lives a long time. Throughout the histories of Vedic literatures, Narada Muni's so many places. He's the guru of Magrari. He's the guru of Prahlad the guru of Dhruva. What was the devotional um, qualities of his disciples? He was the guru of of the sons of Daksha. He was the guru of Valmiki Muni, the author of Ramayan who reveal the beautiful pastimes of Ram for the hall of eternity. Previously, in the 10th canto, we find Narada Muni. He was there in Vrindavan to visit Krishna so many times. 
when he went to see Kamsa, even Kamsa bowed down to him and worshipped and honored him. Such an incredible personality. Narada Muni is the guru of Vyasdev, who is the compiler of all the Vedic literatures. And his incredible powers. We read in the story of Magrari how Narada Muni actually gave him this very, very um, cruel, envious killer of animals. He gave him a vision of his future. He could actually see the future. He gave this most um, degraded, cruel person a vision of what his future would be. Not just like what people do today, they just kind of tell you what your future is going to be, and and you don't really know if it's going to happen or not. (laughs) But they make you really superstitious, so you become afraid. So you'll pay them whatever they want to do some pujas for you. (laughs) But Narada Muni actually gave him a vision of his future. He could see it. So Narada Muni is truly a great mystic yogi who could perform such supernatural, incredible, inconceivable things that we can't even comprehend. And yet, he's totally humbled to see Krishna. And Krishna's not doing it like some great yogi. He's just living his life, sitting on a couch. Narada Muni goes to one palace, and Krishna has little children, and he's petting their heads, and he's you know, t- t- giving them nice encouragement goes to another palace and he's discussing with, with, with his, the generals of the Dwarka <laughs> um, protection forces, you know, what they have to do, different strategies. So inconceivable um, variegatedness. And Krishna's doing it all simultaneously. And Narada Muni could feel, not just see. It wasn't that Krishna's just making a show. Every time Narada Muni came to a different palace, even the one after another after another, and he's seeing the exact same Krishna. Krishna is uniquely surprised and ecstatic to see him after a long time. And that's the way Krishna's feeling. And because Krishna's feeling that, he's giving Narada Muni such such incredibly new happiness in every palace he comes to. Sukadeva Goswami describes, if we even hear these pastimes, we become liberated from all the confusions and the ignorance and the sufferings of this world. So in today's verse, we find in this chapter a description of Krishna's daily activities. Krishna begins during the Brahma Mahorta, very early morning, several hours before the sun even rises. And Krishna's laying in bed, 16,108 beds. (laughs) (laughs) And each queen is thinking, Krishna's only with me. Even though she actually knows that Krishna's with everyone, but still she's thinking, Krishna's only with me. That's the power of Krishna's love. 
but to speak of 16,108. In the spiritual world, there are limitless living beings beyond any ability to count. Even the most um, advanced, technologically efficient computer If you gave it a entire um, millennium to just come up with a big number, it could never create a number that can even begin to explain how many living beings are living in this spiritual world. Countless living beings. Inconceivable. Who could count how many rays are in the sun? Who could count how many rays since the time the sun was created at the beginning of this universe, how many rays have emanated from the sun? Multiply that by crores of times, tens and millions of times, and we cannot even approach how many living beings there are that are emanating from Krishna. Mamaivam so jiva loke jiva bhuta sanat. All living beings are coming from Krishna. They are all part and parcel of Krishna. And yet every living entity, countless living, infinitesimal. Just as Krishna is infinite, we the living entities are infinitesimal. They're, they're tiny little infinite beings. <laughs> But that tiny little infinite being, what is the power of any one of them in a liberated state? It's absolutely incredible. And yet in the spiritual world, every living being, in whatever particular form that person may be, or whatever relationship with Krishna, each is feeling personally, at all times, Krishna's love. That is Ras Bihari. When we come before Gopinath, the Lord of Gopis, or Giridhari, the lifter of Govardhan, or Vrindavan Bihari, Ras Bihari, we should understand, at least in principle, the inconceivable nature of Krishna's capacity to love. <coughs> Intimately. When Krishna danced with gopis, very soon we're going to be celebrating Sharat Purnima during Ras Lila. Each gopi is thinking Krishna's only with me. When Krishna's with his Gopa friends on Bank of Yamuna taking prasad. Each cowherd boy is feeling Krishna's only looking at me. And meanwhile, every flower, every bee, every peacock, every tree is feeling such a personal attention of Krishna. Intimate. That's Krishna's power to love. So what Narada Muni is seeing is awakening such divine ecstasy in his heart. This is Krishna's power to love. He just wants to share it with everyone. So in today's chapter, Krishna's sleeping with his queens, and before the sunrise during Brahma Mahorta, we read that a rooster begins to crow. <laughs> and when the queens of Dwarka hear the rooster crow, 
they're very angry at the rooster. <laughs> Even though Brahma Mohorta is the most auspicious time of the day, they're considering it the most inauspicious because they know that Krishna is going to leave bed. He's going to go and begin his day. And it describes in Dwarka how at that time all of these different living beings, all these different fortunate people in different forms of life are all so harmonious and integrated with each other for Krishna's pleasure. In other words, Krishna is in the center. And everyone has a very different kind of um, service. And in this case, many of them have very different types of bodies and purposes, but they're all in harmony. It describes how the Parijata flower is blossomed during the Brahma Mohorta. And for Krishna's pleasure, creates a most intoxicating fragrance. That fragrance is carried by the air. And not only is it being carried for Krishna to enjoy, but as it's being carried, everybody gets to enjoy it. Shukadev Goswami explains it this way. The Parijata flower's fragrance is so sweet that when the bees, the bumblebees, smell it, they become intoxicated and begin to buzz. And they're so enthusiastic, they're buzzing really loud. And how many bumblebees there are in Dwarka, it doesn't say. But they're all it's it's their kirtan. <laughs> because you see what's happening is the parijata, it's not that they're simply buzzing because of the fragrance of the parijata. Because the fragrance of the parijata is the expression of the parijata's love for Krishna. And that's why this, the fragrance has such an effect on the soul of all of these other living beings. And therefore, the bees are intoxicated by experiencing the prem, the ecstatic love of the flowers. And they're becoming intoxicated by that. And they're buzzing. And then it describes the buzzing of the bees along with the fragrance of the parijata, mesmerizes the birds. And they become so much influenced by the preem of the bees and the preem of the flowers, they, they sing to express that. And how all the different birds are singing. Different types of birds have different types of bodies and different types of voices, and they sing very different songs but they're all united in, they're doing it for Krishna. And you see in Dwarka, in Vrindavan, hopefully Radha Gopinath temple, wherever devotees in whatever form they may be are together, what pleases Krishna most is when we're all with Krishna in the center, which means our own selfish, Egos are taken out of the center. Then we share our enthusiasm, our devotion. We share our service for Krishna's pleasure by inspiring and enlightening everyone else to do their best for Krishna's service. This is satsang. Where we're all trying to be the very, very best we can be 
by being by opening our hearts with a humble spirit to be inspired by others so we could be better for Krishna. And but by doing the best we can, whatever it may be, in our speaking, in our acting, in our thinking, in our intentions, so that we can infuse other people with that energy that we're receiving to inspire their devotion. And in this way, Krishna is most pleased. Katiyantascha mam nityastun tushyanti charamanti cha. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, my devotees derive great satisfaction and bliss remembering me and discussing me among each other and chanting my glories. So this is happening every morning in Dwaraka. Sometimes we may think, oh, I have to get up in the morning. But in the spiritual world, this is what everybody's up in the morning. The bees and the birds and the flowers. Everyone is just... What was that? (laughs) Everyone is, is receiving and sharing the enthusiasm of everyone else. The bees are so indebted to the flowers and the flowers are so indebted to the uh, to the rooster (laughs) (laughs) and the birds are so indebted to the bees and everyone's indebted to each other because everyone's getting inspired and inspiring this is devotional service this is the idea, the concept of Sankirtan. Krishna is non different than his name. Krishna is his name. Sri Radha appears as her name. And when we chant together without envy, as genuine well wishers, then we're actually putting Krishna in the center. As long as there's envy, as long as there's selfishness, as long as there's arrogance, then really Krishna is not in the center. But that's the way many of us are. But we're trying to put Krishna in the center. We're trying to overcome these anartas. Oma pavitra pavitrova. If we, really, if we really sincerely and honestly try to put Krishna in the center by being the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant, then by Krishna's grace, when he sees we're sincere, then through his holy names, through the association of his devotees, he purifies us of these anartas. Then Krishna wakes up and his queens are doing everything they can to keep him with them. But Krishna very lovingly leaves them. And he's performing so many activities just to show us how we should act. Krishna is a householder in this leela. And he's teaching householders how they should be. However comfortable you may be, there's higher principles that we must follow. We should rise early in the morning to become purified. He touches water, very clean water. He describes he touches auspicious things and he looks at auspicious things. And then he meditates. He's teaching us how important our sadhana is. We may think I'm very advanced, so I don't have to do my sadhana. But Krishna is doing sadhana. <laughs> He's meditating.
But who is Krishna going to meditate on? He meditates on himself. That's what's being described here. The uh, Srimad Bhagavatam describes Brahmeti Parabhatmeti Bhagavaniti Shabjate. Krishna is the cause of all causes. Sarva Karana Karanam. He's the source of everything that exists. Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo Mata Sarvam Prabhartate. Ultimately, he simultaneously forever is manifesting as the Supreme Brahman, as the Brahma Jyoti, the all pervading, infinite, omniscient spiritual existence, Paramatma, the localized feature of the absolute truth who is all knowing, who is seated within the heart of every living being within creation. And Bhagavan, the supreme, all-loving, all-attractive personality who possesses all six opulences in full. Beauty, strength, knowledge, wealth, renunciation. What else? Fame. That is Krishna. And the Srimad Bhagavatam explains that there are limitless incarnations and expansions and plenary portions of Krishna. So many avatars, sometimes Krishna appears as Narasenga Dev, Varaha Dev, Matsya, Kurma, Ram, Parasuram. Sometimes for the purpose of creation is Mahavishnu or Karana Dakshai Vishnu, Garbo Dakshai Vishnu, Kshiro Dakshai Vishnu. He oversees the creation, the maintenance and destruction of every universe as Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And all of these limitless incarnations of so many different varieties are always simultaneously existing within Krishna. Who Swayam Bhagavan, who is the avatari, who is the source of all incarnations. In India, sometimes people worship various devatas, demigods. The Srimad Bhagavatam explains, if you worship Krishna like worship, like like watering the root of a tree, automatically you satisfy all parts of the tree. So every demigod is fully worshipped when we worship Krishna. Why? Because if you worship a demigod, you're worshipping that particular demigod. But when you worship Krishna, every demigod is within Krishna. So we're fully satisfying all the demigods not just the one that we happen to like. And there are different incarnations of God that appear in different religions or even in different historical texts of the Vedas. If we worship Krishna, if we please Krishna, all the incarnations, all the avatars throughout eternal histories are all within Krishna. So we satisfy all of them. Ram, Nursinga, Varaha, they are all ecstatically pleased when Krishna is happy. Because they're none different than Krishna. They're within Krishna. And Krishna is the source of all. And Srila Prabhupada explains how for us, every part of the body has its own unique feature. It's like right now we're hearing with our ears and we're seeing with our eyes, unless we're sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) 
We're walking with our feet. But Krishna can eat with his eyes. He could see with his ears. Angana Yasya, the Brahma Samhita tells that every limb of Krishna is absolute and it could perform the functions of every other limb. Because Srila Prabhupada, he's explaining the various opulences of various avatars and then he tells that Krishna is simply Satchitananda Vigraha. That means he's simply the form of eternal knowledge and bliss. His body is completely spiritual. And Srila Prabhupada quotes that some philosophers say that the absolute truth, who's beyond material existence, when comes into this material world, takes a material body or form. But Srila Prabhupada explains that all the ant parashya shakti vivadaiva shruyate, the absolute truth or Krishna is the source of all energies, and he's the controller of all energies. The material energy, the spiritual energy, the jiva shakti, the energy of the eternal soul, of part and parcel of him. So even, Prabhupada says, even if you want to believe that Krishna's body when he comes is material, still, that's that material, he's the controller and he's the source, and he's the ultimate spiritual object and goal of everything and everyone. So even if you want to believe his body is material, it's non-different than him. And therefore, it's completely, totally spiritualized. So it's spiritual. Because for Krishna, there's no difference between material and spiritual. That's our perception. In this way, Krishna is the source of everything that exists. And Krishna is meditating on himself. Because there's nothing, in, there's nothing outside of him. Previous to this event in Dwarka, where Krishna's the great prince of all of Dwarka, he's Dwarka Dish. When he was just a little boy in Vrindavan at Brahmanda Ghat, he ate some dirt. He was just a little child hardly two or three years old. And his friends complained to his mother, Yashoda, Krishna ate dirt. And Yashoda, my Krishna, why did you eat dirt? Now in Dwarka, nobody's chastising Krishna like this. <laughs> He's already exhibited much prowess. Of course, he did in Vrindavan too. He already had liberated Putana, and Trinavarta, and Shakatasura. But still, the sweetness of his childlike love for his devotees covered their ability to recognize his supreme greatness. They were experiencing an even higher supreme greatness of his capacity to exchange loving relationships with his devotees in such a sweet and intimate way. Yashodamai said, if you didn't eat dirt, open your mouth. Krishna said, no, no, I didn't eat dirt, but I'll open my mouth. And she saw the whole universe in his mouth. She saw all the oceans and the planets and the demigods and all living beings. She saw Vrindavan, Gokul. She saw herself looking at Krishna's mouth. And as we say many times, his mouth didn't grow. It wasn't like the Virat Rupa he showed to Arjuna. His mouth was still just a little bit child's mouth but yet the entire universe, and he didn't condense it. He didn't like microchip it, whatever. <laughs> he 
it was actually the whole universe in its full-fledged size within his tiny little mouth. How is that possible? It's not possible. But that is Krishna. He is Yogeshwara. So, Srila Prabhupada, in a very simple way, Krishna taught us through Bhagavad Gita, teaches us through the words of his devotees how we should live our lives. And here he's personally teaching us how we should live our lives. We should meditate on Krishna. (laughs) That's the lesson. We must follow in the footsteps. He's simultaneously taking our position as human beings and teaching us how we should live and at the same time manifesting his, his unexcelled, inconceivable, supreme opulences as the absolute truth. Krishna lifts over Dunhill. And then he dances with gopis. And even while he's lifting Govard on hill, his mother is chastising him. So this is Krishna. In one level, he's teaching us by example. He's exchanging very personal, loving relationships. And he's exhibiting his supremacy. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is that is his very special feature. He is Krishna himself. Krishna teaches us the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita is to surrender. The culmination of Srimad Bhagavatam is that we should chant the holy names to become purified of all of our ignorances. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu plays the role of his own devotee to teach us how to do that. That is why Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita is so important to us. Lord Chaitanya, by his example, similar to this experience, he's serving his devotees, he's washing their clothes, he's cleaning for them. When he's a grihasta, He's taking such nice care of his wife and his mother. And when sages and rishis and, and great persons come to his house, he's serving them prasad and he's, he's cleaning for them and he's please, pleasing them in every way. When he meets his guru, Ishwara Puri, he's praising him, he's massaging him, he's taking initiation from him. He's saying, if, if you bless me by giving me the mantra, then only will Krishna bestow his mercy on me. Lord Chaitanya is saying this. And Ishwarapuri is giving him the mantra. Because he knows by what is Lord Chaitanya's plan. He's showing by his example. So my service is to help him to do so. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu personally, by his words, and by his lila, by his actions, taught us the importance of the association of devotees, the importance of being the servant of the servant of the servant, the, poor, the importance of gaining, gaining a great eagerness to hear about Krishna with each other, speak about Krishna, and chant his holy names. Thank you very much.